We are live. Hello, everybody. Today I have the big pleasure of being here with Jay Allen. For me, he's a, a reference. He has done something that there is no other in the world. So he started a, a, a radio, man, <laughs> to talk about our passion, our common passion, Safety FM, as you guys can see. Jay, thank you for the invitation. It was a dream for me sharing the, the screen and the conversation with you because we are trying to, with small baby steps, create a community in Brazil to discuss safety in general in, in Portuguese. So this conversation is going to be translated for my country mates. Uh, but you are away uh, better than us in a, in a longer journey uh, with this, everything you have been created. So talk a little bit about you and, and how you started with this amazing idea of creating the radio and everything you've been doing for the community. Well, you, well Hugo, let me first start off with saying it's a huge honor to be on your platform. I, oh. I have seen your <laughs> stuff everywhere. And I mean, you're bringing in all kinds of different people and you started off and you're doing this and you're seen everywhere. I see your stuff on social media and on YouTube as it's going out of style. So you're doing something, right? Because you're getting, you're getting traction internationally. So thank you for what you're doing even down there in Brazil, because it is making a reference. And I think that it's great that you're doing it in English and then getting it translated over into Portuguese for people to be able to have an understanding. Because I would imagine that a good chunk of people that are doing safety too currently mostly speak English. So it's probably a little bit difficult to find somebody who's going to speak Portuguese to do this. So I will try to learn some more words in Portuguese the next time I come about, if you do invite me back after this one, and then we can go down there. But to answer your initial question, to be honest with you, I fell in love with radio many, many years ago. I want to say I was about eight years old when I fell in love with radio, to be honest with you. And I thought it was kind of neat when you got stuck inside of your car on how the person that was on the radio kind of really controlled the environment that was inside of your car. So I always thought it was interesting on how they kind of directed, even though traffic could be terrible, but you were still kind of like, ah, oh, they're playing some good music or doing whatsoever. So for a long time, I fell in love with radio, did radio, but then I left the business of radio and went into transportation and warehousing. So I was involved inside of that. And unfortunately, while being inside of that business, I ran into a catastrophic event at one of the, the, the locations that I was overseeing. And somebody had, there was a fatality that ended up occurring inside of the organization, which kind of falls into what most people do. They start looking into safety. Um, so at that time I started looking into safety and really took a deep dive into safety. Safety wasn't important to me during, during that time. I mean, prior to the fatality, it really wasn't that important. It was something that we talked about, but I didn't really care. That's just the, the, the true approach to it. So I started looking around and didn't realize that my whole career was going to change from doing transportation to really just focusing on safety. So as I dove more and more into safety and changed my whole career just to focus on that, I realized that the market had a whole bunch of safety stuff but it was really boring. I mean, I just thought it was boring. I just thought the people were like, I don't want somebody to read a book to me and tell me, hey, this is fantastic. And I kept on remembering how much I loved radio. And I saw that there were some podcasts that are out there. And there was a guy out of New Zealand that had a community radio show that was on a college station. And his name is Matt Jones. And he actually had a show, but it was just one show on this college radio station. And I said, what if we came up with this idea of doing a radio station that spoke about safety, not just one show, but all the shows, and they're not all about the same thing. So we sat in the living room, my wife and I, and we came up with this idea. Now, at the time, we own a company that is called Safety Focus Moment. And I was like, there's no way that that's ever going to stick. That just doesn't make sense. Um, so we said, let's kind of abbreviate the thing. And we called it Safety FM. It was like, ah, it's just meant to be. Radio station, because FM radio is a big thing. <laughs> so we went with it and we put it out there. And here we are today. Um, um, here at the beginning of May will be three years since we've been doing it. We're 19 shows in, heard across the world. Um, with the 19 shows, we've branched off into podcasting. We've branched out even into the world of streaming. So we're doing a little bit of everything. So it's been quite exciting. Wow, <laughs> that's unbelievable. Thank you, guys. And thank you, wife, for uh, supporting this journey because it's not easy. I guess in the beginning, it's, it was tough 
and probably it's still are today making money and support the family with, with this well I, i look at it this way i think i think about it and i go if you kind of go after your passion it changes everything because here's the thing i can work for a, a normal organization and there's nothing wrong against that but I, then i know that i'm committing anywhere between 40 to 60 hours a week at working inside of an organization and i knew that the tradition of what we were doing with the radio station was not normal and believe me it's it's been a it's been a difficult task to try to get it into in front of people because you have like the things that you compete with spotify apple and all these other things that are streaming services. So if I want to listen to a podcast, I can just go directly to it. And that makes sense. So not really a lot of people want to sit around and listen to a radio station unless they really have nothing going on. But what I tell people is it becomes a little bit easier to do to get people involved in the radio station opposed to me telling you, hey, I want you to go find this episode that has this show host and download it. If I don't care about safety, the odds of that happening are pretty slim. Now, if I'm playing this in my office, and I have somebody come in and there's a listen and there's something that's slightly different than the normal, this is safety protocol. One, please make sure that you follow. And it's, and it's different. And I mean, I'm talking about different. Listen to the stuff like Todd Conklin does. That is significantly different. It's storytelling. He goes into some very deep information on what's going on. And it's different. It's almost like a comedian telling you a story. I love Todd, but he has a comedian approach, which I like but he tells you a story and you get something out of it. And I wanted to have those things to bring people's attention on something different. And so, yeah, it is work, but it's fun work. Yes, I totally agree. And as I, this idea is so amazing. So I hope we had something in Portuguese that we could use in this way. But Jay, I think you have a, uh, a problem that I, I have at least. So uh, people, Because most of the time I'm, I'm receiving people to talk, you know, I, pretty much I don't talk. I just ask questions to people and let them, <laughs> let them speak. Uh, and people don't realize that I'm a safety professional as well and I have stuff to say. I just don't say because I'm, I'm the host, I'm receiving people. Do you face this challenge as well? So like people are always uh, thinking that, that you are just hosting the show, but you... you don't have what to say? Is that something that you face sometime in the journey? Well, that's, to be honest with you, to answer, yes, to answer the question, yes, that's exactly what happens. So I do interviews, but what ends up taking place is that I want to make sure that the person that I have on is really the focal point. And my whole thing is when I'm interviewing someone, I want them to tell me something entirely different. I don't care if you wrote a book. I don't care if you have this great streaming service. I want you to tell me something about your story that's entirely different. Um, I will tell you, I had Sidney Decker on the show and people were amazed on how much he opened up during our conversation. And when he told us that nobody knew at that time that he wrote the field guide that he wrote many, many years ago inside of his child's nursery while he was actually on parental leave, no one knew that. And he, that was a story that he had never told to anyone at least not on the air. So that's what I try to look into. But I did get frustrated at some point that I was only sharing other people's stuff. So I was like, I want people to know too. But I kept on getting people contacting me and saying, we want safety in an adult style where we talk in our real language, you know, not censored, not, you know, shying away. So they came up with this idea. They didn't call it this, but it was just kind of an adult approach or direct approach. So we came up with an idea by listening to the audience and we came up with something called the Rated R Safety Show. So luckily on the radio station, five days a week, Monday through Friday, we do a show where I am talking whatever the heck's going on inside of the world of the news. And we talk about that. And we, I give my approach on how certain things are and how, how I view them. But then... When I do the Jay Allen show, which is the interview style show, then I have the opportunity of really putting the, the spotlight on the people that are coming on board, which I think that that's really what a lot of people want to hear is what other people are doing. And then you can listen to me being a smart aleck um, Monday through Friday, if you want to, on the Rated R Safety Show. That's your, that's your choice. I mean, on very rare occasions, do I ever do any anything where it's just about what we have done on the show? And I refuse to this day to do any retrospective 
um, episode. So I won't go back and go, let's take a recap of, of episode 150 that we did. But, because I think if people want to listen to it, they can go back into the podcast and find it. I mean, we can talk about it and maybe put a, a social media post, but I'm not going to say, let's do, let's do a rewind or a recap. It's just, I just don't see a value. Doesn't there. make sense. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, I, I receive a lot of requirements. Some people say, let me interview you. Oh, yeah, and I listen yeah. from you and say, okay, not yet. <laughs> Thank well, but you. That's the, but that's the thing. Here's the thing. You just said something perfect right there where you said, hey, I'm a safety professional and a lot of people don't know that. So what field are you in? What field are you in that your listeners don't know? Yes, interesting question. <laughs> but, 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 what feel, but, but what field of safety are you in? Because you're doing safety, but under what, like, what guidance? Are you in transportation? Are you in an uh, in, uh, in electricity and in nuclear? I mean, what what are you dealing with currently inside of the world of safety? You personally? <laughs> we are changing the, the order of the things over here. Of course, we Actually, always uh, do. <laughs> I started in drilling. I started in drilling in market. I'm a civil engineer. So in Brazil, we need to uh, kind of be an engineer any kind of engineer to be a safety engineer then. So we need five years uh, studying engineering. Uh, I did civil and then safety, two more years. And then I started drilling stuff like the, the construction, heavy construction industry, and then moved it to safety. But now I'm in the chemical and food and fertilizers business. So Ooh, that's, a, that's a change in food and chemical and fertilizer. That's an interesting combination when you really start thinking. Yeah, I work for this really company that does pretty much everything since the, the growth in things, fertilizing the land and then dealing with the, the food business. But we are here so, to- but, but hold on, how do they feel about you doing a podcast? How do they feel about you doing a show about this subject? I never <laughs> asked. <laughs> best way to do it, probably the very best way to do it. <laughs> I never asked, man. Uh, but, but probably, no, news is good news, huh? Yeah. We'll, we'll leave it at that. I won't check it. <laughs> Let's keep it like that. Hey, we want to listen to your opinion about some things that I'm pretty sure you you know and you'll be discussing and listening to the best in the world. So how do you see these things about safety one and two, just to make it easier to people understand? Uh, give me your thoughts. Because we are talking before they start recording and you say, it depends what you see as new view and old view. So what is the new and the old view in your lamps? Well, I mean, here's the thing. When you start talking about human and organizational performance or safety too, as most people do, I, I really go back to the far as back to the basics. And it's really talking about the principles of hop. So the normals are people make mistakes, blame fixes nothing, context drives behavior, learning is key, how management responds a failure is to failure is key to everything that's going on. So what I look at is that if I go into your organization and if you're doing Norm, we'll say normal safety. We'll call it safety one, but let's say normal safety where the person did something wrong, they're to blame and so on. And I try to start driving these five principles after you've invested thousands of dollars and maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars into your safety program and say, stop what you're doing and let's change it. Probably not going to go too far. So you have to really go in where people are at. And a lot of people have a, a struggle with this when they first start. It's like, but our, our organization is so old school and they don't want to change the method on what they're doing. That's fine. Because if I can walk in there and I can only get one principle started where they're thinking, huh, mistakes are normal. This is okay. These are the things that happen. Let's work on that. That's progress. Things are already starting to change. The mental model is changing. But we have these people that are out there. And I'll tell you, I was, I'm as guilty as charged because I did it at the very beginning too, where I would go in and go, no, things need to change. You're doing it wrong. This is the right way. Not taking the correct approach. You have to always realize that management has already made a large investment or the leadership, however you want to look at it, into their organization. And this is what they believed worked. Somebody already told them about this versionality of safety. And that's what was going to be best suited for the organization at the time. So I come in, they don't know anybody, they don't know me. They don't know me from anybody else. Why are they going to take my word? You have to prove concept in theory as you go in there. Because imagine you walk in, you start talking about human and organizational performance. And at the same time, you say, oh yeah, by the way, it's a philosophy, not a program. Can you imagine the shock, the moment that that occurs? 
So you have to take it slow. You kind of have to ease them into it. What's your thought on that? When you are doing consultants for companies like they are trying to implement the, the new view or, or the human organizational performance, what's the most common situation that you that companies are when you step there? So what are kind of problems that they are facing? Is there a, a something that you can recognize from the first sight? So common well, thing? Well, most of the issues when you first start off, no, most people contact you under two things. There has been a severe injury or there's been a fatality. So auto, no, it's realistic. That's Just re normal. reacting. Right. It's a reaction portion. So it's automatically one of those two things. And then that's when they want to start talking. That's the conversation. They're open to the idea. Now, of course, you have OSHA here where if you have to make sure that you're following within OSHA standards and guidelines and so on. So they're worried that OSHA is going to come in and something might end up occurring. So they're willing to listen at the time. But emotional responses and actual responses are severely different. When something emotional happens, people will actually adjust to it for six to eight weeks is normally the average before they fall back into the norm. So it's really starting to talk about driving and changing that behavior. It's okay. Let's talk week one. Let's talk week two. Let's start implementing week three. And as we move forward and not let it just die down, it's actually going in and continue to the ongoing discussions. But some people, when they get to week six, go, oh, well, there's nothing that's changed. So why are we going to stop right now? So that's going to be something that you have to consider when you go into these organizations and you start talking about this stuff. Something that I realized and I'm actually currently writing about it is that now that this safety tool concept is being discussed, and when I say safety tool, again, just to make it clear, I'm talking about everything that different names, safe differently, hoppy and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's being discussed everywhere, pretty much. And there are situations where there is proactive uh, people. Most of the cases, safety professionals try to implement it without those two situations that you mentioned that are the, the most common. Uh, but sometimes they face difficulties for convince their leadership and everything. I guess that in these situations that you just mentioned, it's coming from the leadership. They, they decided to do this step. But in right. the proactive way, it's coming from the safety pros. Well, so, let's talk about the proactive way for a moment, because here's where it's going to be severely different. I'm so let's say a profession <laughs> today, everybody. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but I just want you to look at it this way. If I'm a safety professional and I've heard about this and I've heard about hop and I want to bring these concepts in to my organization and you just don't think that the leadership's going to listen to what you have to say, you have to find someone who is essentially an influencer inside of your organization. You have to find someone who will be willing to partner with you on some of these ideas. But here's where you have to step back and you have to make the decision is, are you wanting the fame and the glory for this or are you caring about the organization? Because if you're caring about the organization, it's entirely different because then you're able to partner, share this information and they're able to influence and speak to leadership to make this happen. You might have to find several people in several different segments of the organization to get this to happen. But if you're more worried about flame, flame and glory about your name, that probably will not work out for you. So it becomes a very interesting, happy medium. Do I care about people or do I want to be known? Sometimes it happens in both, but most of the times the people that are bringing it as, as the influencers are the ones that are going to get the recognition for it. And that's something that most people need to understand. Great point. And, and that was the, the, my question would be in, in this direction. So in, in, in this situation, when you want to be proactive and you doesn't have, for example, a, a high level in the organization, if you are a, a shop for safety tech or especially something like this, uh, what would be the approach? What do you, you, you said that you need to look for a, a strong partner response for, so, well, so it's, it's something well, that I, I think it's important. I think one of the best things that you can do if you really want to see change inside of your leadership, um, and I know you recently had Todd on to your show, and by the way, congratulations on writing the forward for Todd's <laughs> book as well. Um, but he has a book that came out many, many years ago um, that's called Simple Revolutionary Acts. And it's interesting because I've spoken to Todd several times 
um, about this book. It's probably one of my favorite books that I've ever read. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on your show and I love Todd, but this book, when we spoke about it years later and he decided to read it for Audible, um, he didn't realize the impact that that book had in his hop journey in regards on how that was the influence of some of the things that he was already thinking about. And that book talks about how you need to change your organization. And it talks about simple approaches on things that you can do. They're not safety driven. They're not operation driven. They're about the organization as a whole. And I really think that if you're going to start down this journey, that's where you start. It's a very simple read book. Um, it's, avail it's available on Amazon. It's available on Audible. But it's one of those books that when you take a read of it, it just makes sense as the beginning stage of the journey. I'll tell you, when I put people through, through our versionality of a hop class, we call it Hop 101, that is where we start. We start off with the studying of that book, and then we go down the journey. Yeah, so uh, not being humble now, but you just made the, his book like a bestseller in Brazil again. So probably <laughs> he's going to call me to try to tr translate this one. Well, no, well. I, I, mean, I'll, I, I mean, if you want to, this is no joking. I can contact Todd if he wants to do it. In, um, if he wants to actually change it over to Portuguese, I would probably say that would probably be one of the best books because it, it's the beginning of the journey. Now, the five principle book is important, but I th really think that this is, a great add-on. It's a very good beginning point if you don't know where to take your organization to start off from. Perfect. Jay, what are the, the main, uh, the most impressive practices that you have been noticing companies uh, related to the to the near view, the five principles or this? Is there, because that's the only, the, the, the most common question that people say. So the question usually is, uh, what difference will I note in a company that practices this new view thing? So is that perceptible? No, I can perceive this. I can note this when I step there. Well, I, here's the thing. You recognize automatically that they are a learning and improving environment. They're listening to the workers. You can go into an organization and really see the difference of the organization that's willing to listen. And I will tell you, another thing that changes normally in the dynamics is they don't have a safety culture in most of the organizations that are doing well. And most people are going to be like, what? Because they don't look at it as a safety culture. They look at it as part of their normal culture of everyday work that they do, which is significantly different. When you go in somewhere normally, it's go safety, 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 safety. They're still kind of separated. When it's incorporated into everyday work that the organizations that are in implementing hop with, it's great. You can tell the difference. And a lot of this is driven by so one of the one of the simplest foundations inside of hop, which is learning teams. Exactly. I was uh, investigating. I was doing this work just to make it simple. Uh, uh, a first aid in, in my company, and it was impossible to avoid, you know, so... We had uh, an event and some uh, acid spill uh, from somebody forgot to, to screw the, uh, a flange uh, and the splash guard was not well screwed as well. So the splash, the guy was doing a totally different work 20 meters ahead, away from the, this position and the, the acid like splash in, a, in another metal part and it was projected to him. 20 meters in a different Ooh. position of the, but nothing happened. It stopped in the uniform. Uh, and during the investigation, I was just pretty much introducing and facilitating the learning team and letting people talk, no bosses in the room, just people free to, to discuss. And then they started talking about the event, how it worked and, and everything, and how they could create a different kind of uh situation where they could not make this mistake again like uh, a full cover uh for the flange and everything and after the uh, i think 40 minutes of conversation I, I i told them hey we never you guys never talked about the victim or the operator doing something wrong and not screwing properly the so congratulations i think we are there we are in a situation where we can say that we have the hop implementation going on. So is this a, a good sign? Is this something that we could, because people always say about 
uh, indicators and everything, but most of the cases you feel, you know. No, I, I think that right there, you're definitely talking about that they're taking a good approach if they're willing to have the conversation and they're talking about the incident. Um, and it all depends on how the facilitator is also leading um, the learning team, because I think that that's a, another crucial part. A facilitator has a lot to do there, because here's the fun part. As the facilitator, you can't really talk. You can kind of lean and help and provide, but they're not wanting your expertise. They're wanting the expertise of the people in the room. And when you say that there was no bosses there and they started talking about the incident, I think it's great because here's the other thing. When they realize how open you are to having this conversation, they'll also acknowledge other incidents that could be potentially that could happen inside of the organization and say, well, we also might have an issue over here. And we might also have an issue over there on a potential issue. And when you start building that, you really have a great organization as you're moving forward. Yeah, and the interesting thing is that we have pretty much operators in the room and one of them brought the, oh, okay, it, it can be safer, but it can be uh, um, more expensive and everything. And, and the other said, but okay, but if we change something in the other situation, we can save this money and use it here. So I said, yeah, that's what we, we mean by human and organizational. It's not human safety performance. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you need to think. In, in the whole thing, in the context, and then provide the better situations, the best situations for for everybody. So talking about learning organizations, I have another question for you related to this. It's also something that people doesn't know how to measure. And as we deal with engineers every day, we are always trying to measure uh, stuff. Uh, how can we see that we have, we are, in a, or we are building a, a learning organization. Is that any sign that we can realize? Well, well I'll tell you, in this, I'm going to tell you, this is going to be slightly self-serving at the same time, too, because I'm going to talk about some people that are on the network. So Brett Sutton, Brett Robinson, and Glennis McCarthy host a show on the network that's called The Practice of Learning Teams. They have recently written a book that's re all related about how to handle learning teams um, and what they talk about a lot inside of their inside of their stuff is tying in lean to some learn some, to some learning teams tie-ins, and they they focus on this thing that Deming talked about. That is the PDCA model, which is plan, do, check, act. And I really think that when you start building that inside of your environment, you can see how things are advancing. So you might have an engineer that's out there that might have some questions about what's going on. And when you start giving them kind of like form information, oh, this is what we're planning, this is what we're doing, this is what we've been checking, this is how we're gonna act going forward, it might satisfy them at the very beginning in regards of what's going on. So maybe those are some of the things that would be a good indicator. Um, maybe that's another book that you need to, to look into <laughs> to actually translate. I mean, it's a, it's a really good read and it takes some deep dives into how to really access learning teams. But it goes, it does this model that's really different. Opposed to doing a learning team post-event or doing a learning team because something happened, it's about doing everyday learning teams. And, le and not for the full sequence that you would think. It's kind of a, a modification tying in some of the lean concepts as well. I think it works well if you do take a, take a dive into it. So I would imagine you must do a lot of reading. Um, based on yes. a lot of stuff that, that you Yesterday, might... actually, I indicated this book for a friend that he read the book that I translated, Todd's book. Mm -hmm. and, I, I, and I did a, an astrological uh, preview in, in the foreword, the, the book that I translated for. for so I have a question. I will tell you, audio books here in the U.S. are very popular. Are they very popular in Brazil as well? In Portuguese, yes. In English, in I, I, I don't know. Well, I would imagine not in, I would imagine not in English, so... Are, are we going to see you author a book here or actually uh, narrate a book in Portuguese? Uh, maybe some of Todd's work or anything like that? I'm just asking. I'm just asking the question, throwing some ideas out there. Yes, maybe it's a good idea. I know. And I need to write <laughs> my, my own book. I, I'm working on this. <laughs> but I, oh, I actually... Hold on. No, no, no. This is an exclusive. You said you're writing your own book. We have to have some more information. Now. So what, are you, <laughs> what are we looking at date? Is there a title? What's going on? Let's hear. No, no title yet. But I, I want to... Uh, show Brazilians the journey we, we had in, in our company to from nothing to 
having the the hop implementation fully impl implemented so that's the, oh, the embryonary yeah. idea you know so you are taking the exclusive but <laughs> i'm taking the exclusive pressure. on your show i like it it's an exclusive <laughs> on your show it works well it's pressuring uh, me most that i already have yeah pressure. this better not be edited out i'm gonna i'm gonna mention about this edit several times to get cut out. <laughs> i will cut this part <laughs> but, but during the the foreword that i wrote for todd i mentioned uh i, I did a, a forecast or a prevision that in two or three years, it's, go it's not going to be possible to see uh, a company discussing only the old view or, or the traditional view of safety. Somehow it's going to have some uh, new view or some safety tool into the system. I don't know if complete, but some. Uh, well, give me your thoughts I, I, on this. I, I agree with you. I agree with you on that you'll see changes throughout the region. But here's the thing that you have to think about, too almost think about the different versions of safety as religion or cultural. So let me kind of explain what I mean here. When you talk about certain formats of safety, some people look at it as a religion. That's the only one that works. Nothing else does. It's just, it's just reality. It's just kind of how it goes. But if you go in there and you try to do the change through culture, and I'm talking about stuff like that you would see like a really a, a culture company do, where they would actually change something. That's the approach to take. It's not the approach of, hey, this is it and nothing else can change. Because here's the thing, when you're talking about two or three years down the road, what happens when you go into the company that still has the older style of safety? Are they wrong? Or is it something that they've never heard of? Because that's gonna be the other component as well. Just because something's popular in this segment of the culture or inside of the world, does not mean that it's popular everywhere. I mean, let's just use the example of what we're talking about now. You're saying that it's becoming big in Brazil. Well, if you go back and take a look at when Safety 2 first came about, depending on who you talk to, it varies between 25 to 30 years ago. So you're, there's no way that I believe that you guys are that far behind. No way. I'm just saying that it was probably not packaged the way that it is currently as it got down there. I'm sure somebody heard of it. You can't tell me it took that long. I mean, I know we're slow, but there's no way I believe the other way around. Exactly. Clear. And I always tell people that it's not a religion. No, my English is not perfect, <laughs> but I use the same word. It's not a religion. You can change, you know. <laughs> In Brazil, well, I mean, you're, you're kind of a glamorized minister. Think about it for, for a segment. I mean, think about it. If you look at the, like the Star Wars movies, and this is not a joke as I'm saying this, on how they talk about the force and how it works this way, that there's like a good side and a bad side of the force. It's essentially almost the same thing. When you really start talking about it, it's like, well, this will kind of help you and help people and so on. And I will tell you there, I've even had people kind of break it down into politics on how you look at safety. And I'm just like, ah, I don't know if I want to go that far. Yes. And I have <laughs> a friend that helps me a lot here in, in Brazil, Paulo Gomes. He's introduced a lot of people that I received in my channel. And we started a, a channel uh, and a community in LinkedIn. Uh, and I always tell this to him, you know, so he's trying to, discuss with the consultants and, and, and some kind of situation and say, hey, uh, it's not like this. It's not by force. You know, you need to to put your your side of the view, your, your point of view, and then show it's better in some, some ideas and maybe not. But if you try to force, if you polarize the discussion, you are going to, um, you're not being succeeded on this, you know, because polarization doesn't help anybody. And anywhere you know we are in a situation political situation over here you were as well sometimes ago and so it's not the way we need to, to go. so you i got a question for you then so when everything opens up and starts kind of normalizing in brazil are you planning on putting any kind of hop conference together i mean it seems like you're getting a lot of people that you're that you're getting their attention and it looks like you're putting a lot of attention on the subject is that anything that you've been thinking about yes that's the idea uh, we did something Similar in the in the San Luis neighborhood where our headcounts are, we 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 brought Cargill and other companies that are close by Mississippi Lime, us, and I want to do the same in, in Brazil if I have the opportunity. Maybe the company is gonna fire me because of those. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not the case, but it, I mean I think it's a great idea. Of course, once people the, you know the vaccine becomes more normalized and goes around the world, I mean I think that. People are hungry for something different inside of this segment. Yes. I mean, and I know that a lot of people look at it now as this is a safety thing, but
But look at the five principles of Hop alone. And I have the host already, Jay Allen. Oh, no, 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 no. But look at it. I mean, think about it for a second. The five principles of Hop can apply to so many different things. It doesn't have to just be a safety thing. It can apply to so much. And the funny thing is that if you do a lot of research on where this came from, and you start taking a look on how it came, became part of the nuke world before it actually made it into really the safety segment, it's pretty interesting on how it all started. Perfect. And, and that's the idea. And, and surprisingly, there is a lot of uh, volunteers. The, the people say, oh, I'll go. I, I can go. I need to go. I, I see the movement in Brazil and everything. I say, wow, <laughs> thank you. I'm going to work on this. And so, Jay, uh, the time is flying. So, uh, final <laughs> question <laughs> uh, related to the community. We are, in, as I mentioned, in baby steps, trying to grow. Uh, bringing the, the best minds together to discuss these safety issues uh, in Brazil, trying to put material in Portuguese, trying to put people together to discuss. Actually, I have a project, another ex exclusive. Uh, I'm bringing and inviting with Ricardo Patriarca uh, gave me his support on putting together the best uh, scientists in Brazil that are writing about performance and safety. And we are creating a monthly uh, conference or, or chat to put them to present their papers that, that are in some kind of a safety magazine or, or research. Oh, congr congratulations. That is awesome. That is very yeah, good. So we are trying, we are receiving now in this moment, we are receiving applications for, for this. And we are doing this. Uh, we have a, a board of scientists to, to choose the best ones and the best one or the most interesting for the moment is gonna be presented by the author in Portuguese because most of them, they know the English language, but they are not confident enough to, to speak. So that's the, the idea behind everything. And I wanna listen for you, you create something amazing. And uh, what should we do to, to make this community stronger and to grow this community to put the best minds discuss the, the passion, this passionate issue? Well, I mean, I think that, the, I mean, what you're doing is that you're starting off with science, which I always think is important, but you also, besides having science, you want to have the common person be able to speak inside of there too, because here's the thing. When you start hanging out with academics, they want to speak in academia language, which is fine, but the average user, such as myself, even though I am an academic, um, the average user is such as myself, that doesn't intrigue me. So you have to have a different portion where you might have some scientists, but somebody else who speaks the, the normal language, because I don't want to go back with academic language trying to impose it. Now I can go back and show the leaders inside of the organization. Here's the science behind it, which that makes sense, but it's being able to have the standard conversation because if I'm a construction worker and you're implementing hop in my daily work life, you give me academic academia, I'm not going to care. You have to speak a normal language and make it real. Not everything that we do is perfect. Not everything that we implement works. And talk about those failures because those failures will lead to successes. And most people don't want to talk about when they fail. Talk about them. People will kind of really admire what you're doing in that fashion. Perfect. And that's, I always tell Todd that his, this is his main uh, and most amazing uh, characteristic. He's able to talk to everybody. Everybody understands what, so he doesn't have this, even being a PhD, he, he's, he speaks the, the people's language, you know? So I always mm -hmm. tell, there is a lot of people, uh, interesting people, amazing, great minds, but if people can choose, they will choose listen to talk because he can. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> hit, 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 one of the things that he says that I still love to this day is fail gracefully. And that is a Todd line. If you can fail, fail gracefully. And that's it. That's really the whole key. I mean, I will tell you, if you look back at our first 100 podcast or shows, it is essentially a love letter to Todd Conklin's work because he's just the best that there is out there. Thank you, Jay. Did I miss some question? Oh, you go. No, you did an excellent job. I love the opportunity, but as you can see, I can't shut up sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I think we can do a second session sometime. I will be more prepared because you are, you know, so such an entertainment guy, you know, and 
You know well, everything about this thing of hosting people and talking and moving. And I, I was amazed by how you handled this. I just stay quiet and like this. So I learned a lot. Thank you. Well, and, what we need to do is do it the other way. At some point when you're when you have time and I will work around your schedule, I would love to have you come on to mine. Now you nice. tell me we can do it live if you want to. Wow. That's we, do it, we can do it, we can do it live or we can do it pre-recorded. Whatever, whatever you do. Hello, everybody. I've been invited for the most famous and the biggest show in the safety in the world. So <laughs> respect no, I mean, me it, from now. <laughs> No, I mean, and we'll leave, we'll leave it up to that. I, I, we can do it. We can do it live, or we can do it pre-recorded. Whichever one works easier. But I want to work within your schedule. Thank you. Okay. This is big. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye -bye. Speak then. Thank you.